Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you are safe and very healthy. Uh, I'm Aaron David Miller, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And welcome to Carnegie Connects, a series of virtual conversations on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Today will be our last Carnegie Connects uh, for 2020, and we're going to focus on an issue that's likely to be among the most important that the incoming Biden administration confronts, and that is how to deal with Iran in many different capacities. Governing is about choosing and setting priorities. And so for a very busy president, I, I suppose it's uh, logical to ask the question, why Iran? As the new administration looks around the world, there are ample areas of trouble spots. But how many, I wonder, carry the prospects of creating serious combustion or even conflict early in a president's term, particularly one that's focused largely on domestic priorities? Sure, Biden may get challenged by the Russians, by the North Koreans, or by the Chinese early in some sort of test. But with Iran, I think you really do uh, get the whole package. You've got Iran's threat, at least by the parliament, to ramp up its nuclear activity and threats to remove the IE inspectors by February. You already have an escalatory cycle on the ground with U.S. and Israeli hits uh, on uh, prominent members associated with the regime, Qasem Soleimani in January and Masan Fakhrizadeh most recently. You have toxic politics in both Tehran and Washington and profound mistrust in the absence of confidence, and the very real potential of nothing is done to mitigate the possibility of a serious conflict between Israel and Iran that might actually draw in the United States. And this would obviously, this eventuality would pose a serious problem for a new administration focused on domestic recovery. So what to do? Uh, as usual, there are more questions than answers. Um, First, are we done with Trump and Iran? There are 30 plus days left before the inauguration of a new president. Uh, does this provide time and space for some surprise? How's Iran thinking about approaching a new administration? Does it have a strategy? What are its expectations? And will the June presidential elections be a constraint, a facilitator, or a non-factor in all of this? And what about Biden? He seems to have signaled a preference for clean re-entry re into the uh, JCPOA, or does he ascribe or others around him to the leverage school that somehow we now have more leverage and we can get more from Iran and produce what uh, some have called a longer and stronger agreement? And of course, is re-entering the JCPOA Any questions, the role of outside parties, the P5, Israel, the Emiratis, the U.S. Congress, particularly if the Republicans maintain control of the Senate. Thankfully, as usual, I don't need to answer any of these questions. But we have three remarkable panelists uh, who will. Suzanne Maloney. Uh, is Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. She previously worked on Middle East issues in the Department of State and in the private sector. She's published several books on Iran. Karim Sajapur, one of my colleagues, distinguished at Carnegie, is a senior fellow there, uh, where he focuses on Iran and U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East. And, of course, Michael Singh, who I've known for a very long time, Elaine Twig, Senior Fellow and Managing Director of the Washington Institute and, form, Institute and former Senior Advisor, Director, sorry, for Middle East Affairs at the National Security Council. I can't imagine a better group. So let's get started. Uh, Kareem, um, I, I'll turn the virtual space over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's terrific to be with three colleagues, four colleagues, three colleagues whom I have enormous respect for, Suzanne, uh, Mike, and of course yourself, Aaron. Um, I'll be brief in my introductory remarks uh, talking about um, the dynamics in Tehran, you know, what perhaps President Biden's priorities are going to be, and then just break it down into three uh, boxes. 
um, the, the nuclear strategy, uh, the, the regional strategy, and then Iran domestic strategy. So um, shifting first to Tehran, there's a, there's a quote I once heard from Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, and he was asked about um, his, his management style as CEO of Amazon. And he said, really, um, we're inflexible about vision, but we're flexible about details. And for me, that kind of captures the, the uh, modus operandi of Ayatollah Khamenei. He's been really inflexible about the ideological vision of the Islamic Republic, but he can be flexible on details, you know, making a tactical compromise, for example, to get sanctions removal of JCPOA. Um, but there's been tremendous continuity in Iran's basic uh, philosophy of, of resistance and, you know, their domestic uh, uh, repression, etc. Now, when it comes to President-elect Biden, there's a passage from President Obama's memoir which stood out for me in which uh, Obama was talking about being briefed in the Situation Room about the prospects of a potential conflict with Iran. And he said that he realized that if conflict with Iran became necessary, it would upend everything else that he was trying to do in his presidency just as the Iraq war up ended George W. Bush's presidency. So I think that uh, President Biden begins with the premise that he, <clears throat> his priorities are obviously domestic and he wants to try to defuse and de-escalate any potential uh, conflicts with Iran, which leads me to the first point, which is uh, the nuclear uh, situation, the nuclear issue and how they want to manage that. Um, it seems to me, Aaron, that there's kind of three potential options that they have. Number one is to simply return to status quo ante, return to the deal right away, and then hope to later strengthen that via uh, negotiations. Number two, as you alluded to, is to um, use the leverage, the pressure, the sanctions they're inheriting from the Trump administration in order to try to negotiate a stronger deal before returning to it. And number three is the belief that perhaps the, the mistrust between the two sides is simply too wide to be bridged to go back to um, go back to status quo ante, and, and nor does he want to um, begin by pressuring and potentially starting an escalatory cycle with Iran. And so the third option is essentially a, 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 a freeze for freeze or a partial return to the deal. Now. The president-elect Biden has stated publicly that his preferred path is, is essentially number one, is to um, return to the nuclear deal, um, obviously on the premise that Iran would also need to return to the deal, no questions asked, no reparations or anything like that, and then try to um, strengthen the agreement, address some of the expiring sunset clauses, the missiles, uh, you know, potentially Iran's um, regional behavior. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, my view is that option one may be difficult given the enormous mistrust and animosity between the two sides. And so the third option of a partial return may make more sense. But when I talk to my colleagues who are non-proliferation experts, they, they, they argue that it's tough to um, given how detailed the JCPOA was as a document, it's tough to somehow imagine how you um, return to it partially, not fully. So that's the nuclear file. On the regional situation, I'd say that one of the important lessons that was learned uh, during the Obama administration's negotiations with Iran and the nuclear file was that um, Iran is not going to change its regional behavior just because it's negotiating on the nuclear issue, meaning a, a nuclear compromise uh, is not going to be indicative of Iran altering its long-standing regional behavior. So just as Iran walks and chews gum at the same time, the United States also needs to walk and chew gum at the same time. And think about a strategy which contains or constrains Iran's role in the region. My own view, I think I've shared this with you before, Aaron, is that in the past, I think both the United States and our regional partners, Israel and in particular the Gulf countries, have always kind of aspired for a 10 out of 10 uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. Iran in the region, which is 
Let's get Iran entirely out of the Arab world. Let's get them to stop supporting Hezbollah, stop supporting Bashar Assad. And frankly, we've attained zero out of 10 because none of those behaviors have changed. And so I, in my view, I think we need to think more about what does a five out of 10 approach look like? An approach whereby um, we recognize that Iran is not going to stop supporting Hezbollah and Assad and the Houthis and the uh, Shia militias in Iraq. But how do we um, you know, limit, constrain that support? How do we interdict some of the both financial and military support? And how do we expose that support? In my view, that's, that's an important facet of it because this has an internal uh, domestic Iranian component, which is people in Iran whose quality of lives have really deteriorated, increasingly resent the idea that their um, money is being spent on Arab militias while, you know, as I said, there's so many domestic problems at home. And that leads me to the third block, and I'm going to stop after this, which is um, how is the domestic situation in Iran and how should the Biden administration think about uh, uh, approaching um, Iran domestically? In, in my view, um, obviously, the, the leader is Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. He's 81 years old. He's firmly in charge. There's a lot of constant rumors about his poor health, but, you know, he um, he, he seems, uh, th these rumors, as Suzanne and Mike can attest to, we've been hearing for two decades. Um, you know, I would say that um, the country is certainly transitioning from uh, a system ruled by elderly Shiite clerics to a system ruled by middle-aged revolutionary guardsmen. You know, I think that train has left the tracks and it's unlikely to, to reverse itself. Um, the, the only thing I, I guess I'd say is that it's my view that just as I said, we can walk and chew gum with Iran in the regional context. We should also be able to do that in the domestic context, meaning we shouldn't shy away from condemning uh, Iran's abuses of human rights. For example, the execution of the social media activist uh, uh, Ruho Lazam, um, thinking that, um, you know, if we are silent about their uh, the domestic human rights abuses, that will lead them to be um, more likely to return to the nuclear deal. They're returning to the nuclear deal because their economy necessitates it, not because we're going to be nice to them or mean to them. But, and, and this is my final thought, um, it seems to me that the assassination of, you know, Qasem Soleimani, Al-Qaeda's number two have been based in Tehran, and most recently, nuclear scientist and revolutionary card commander Mohsen Farah That obviously makes the security forces in Iran appear to be um, pretty feckless and vulnerable. And so I, I, I do think that the regime, by executing this um, social media activist and perhaps really clamping down internally, is trying to send a message to the population don't think our security forces are, are weak or vulnerable. Don't get any ideas. We're still firmly in control. Kareem, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, your, your notion of LEI, limit, expose, and interdict, is an interesting alternative to the 10 out of 10. Um, more on that later, I think. Suzanne, uh, let me turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Aaron, and thanks to you and everyone at Carnegie for organizing this conversation. I'm really glad to be here. I've had a bit of technical issues uh, so far this morning, so for those of you in the audience, if I either completely repeat everything my good friend Kareem Sejapur has just said, then I will feel very honored to have gotten something right. Uh, and if I completely contradict him, um, please know it's uh, done accidentally. And I hope uh, as we go, well, uh, I think I can now see him. So I'm thinking that some of these issues are now resolved. But let me just start with a couple of broad points that I hope will contribute something to our conversation. And I'm really looking forward to uh, Mike's remarks and Aaron's uh, questions and everything that we're gonna talk about over the course of the next uh, 43 minutes or so. Um, the first point I want to make is is one that both Kareem and Mike have heard and um, frankly shouldn't be a sort of uh, uh, epiphany for anybody, but um, I think in the context of the, the Iran policy debate that we've had over the course of the past decade or so, uh, it just needs to be reinforced. And that is the point that Iran is not a nuclear issue. Um, for obvious reasons, the nuclear question and Iran's nuclear ambitions are the most urgent of the concerns that the United States has had for at least 15 years and in some respects longer. 
Um, but it is not the only issue that we contend with with respect to Iran, and we have to devise a policy that is not, uh, it does not really subordinate these other questions um, about Iran's regional activities, its treatment of its own population, um, some of the other activities it engages in around the world and around the region, um, in a way that really doesn't leave them very much at the mercy of the nuclear question. And we've got it. I want to make is is simply that um, while the Obama administration, you know, was very clear, and certainly President Obama himself was explicit that in fact there was not a, an intention to sort of presume that the other issues would resolve themselves simply on the basis of nuclear diplomacy. There was this sense, I think, widely, and it was explicit on the part of at least some within the Obama administration, that a nuclear deal could beget progress on other fronts simply because it would prove the value of diplomacy, it would create stakeholders on the Iranian side for engagement with the United States, and it would um, enable the establishment of a greater constituency within Iran for more responsible treatment of its, of its own citizenry as well as a more responsible approach to the region and the world around. I think this was always a flawed assumption, um, despite the fact that it's an appealing one, I think what we know over the course of the past 40 years or so is that Iran is exceptionally good at managing multiple files, uh, even where they're contradictory. And um, I think it's absolutely critical that we engage around the nuclear issue, but that we don't um, uh, sort of short shrift the rest of the, the very serious concerns that we have about Iranian activity, Iranian conduct, uh, and Iranian policies. And so that, that really means um, situating an approach to coming back to something that looks like the JCPOA, either in full form or in the form of some kind of a, an interim agreement that might permit negotiations toward extending and expanding the terms of the deal in a way that address the deficiencies that, that were in the original agreement, as well as address um, the fact that we are now in a period of obsolescence of the JCPOA. It is a slow moving process on some fronts, but it is a quick moving process on other fronts. And some of the first uh, uh, quote unquote sunset clauses will expire during the Biden administration's first term. And there has to be an approach that really uh, doesn't put this off any longer. We really have no choice on that. On that. But we have to do it in a way that, that uh, incorporates what has enabled us to succeed on the nuclear issue in terms of generating a multilateral uh, diplomatic arrangement that withstood tremendous pressure. A lot of time, a lot of pushback, frankly, from the Iranians or non-engagement in any kind of constructive way for many years. Remember the P5 plus one was not in fact established by the Obama administration as a Mike knows better than anyone else. It was a Bush administration innovation. Um, and and uh, it, was, it has proven to be, I think, one of the most successful ad hoc multilateral groups um, on any given issue uh, that has faced the United States. We have to be able to do the same to the other questions, uh, particularly around the region and on Iran's behavior at home. Second big point is that um, I, I, I think, you know, while Iranian domestic politics is endlessly fascinating and it's real, um, I don't mean to suggest that uh, there is, the, the internal politics of Iran are either fictitious, fictitious or irrelevant. I think that we have unfortunately somewhat fetishized the idea of moderates and reformists and the divisions within the Iranian political establishment um, because they're not tremendously relevant to the determination of how Iran makes its most central national security decisions. Um, the deal that was done in 2015, the JCPOA, was not a deal of reformists or moderates. It was not facilitated by some um, schism within the Iranian political establishment. It was the deal that, uh, that Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, and of course, you know, the, the most important hardliner within the Iranian system, is the deal that he wanted. Um, and that is the only deal that could be done with the Islamic Republic then or now. And I think we have to be quite um, sort of uh, direct and deliberate about this. We can't go through the pretense that there is somehow the possibility of utilizing our diplomacy either to strengthen moderates or find reformists or uh, marginalize hardliners. We don't have that nuance. And frankly, it's just not a, a function of the Iranian system as it exists today. There has, as I said, there's real divisions. There's, there have been moments in Iranian history where I think there was a trajectory 
an alternative trajectory to the strengthening of the Islamic Republic, but we're not in one of those moments now, and I don't see one in the foreseeable future, and I certainly don't see the United States being having the capacity to leverage whatever differences exist within the system to try to change things for the better in terms of Iranian decision making. Um, this is a regime, and I think Kareem has probably said this, and if he hasn't, I'm sure he will. It's a regime that is predicated on hostility and antagonism toward the United States, and that will not change. It simply will not change unless there is a change in regime. And I'm not proposing regime change, but I think we have to be very straightforward about that. And the point that Kareem may have made, and and certainly will at some point speak to, I'm sure, over the course of our conversation, is that. You know, one of the, the best examples of this is the fact that on the very day that the nuclear deal was, was finalized in 2015, uh, a good friend of Kareem, someone I've known for a very long time and consider a good friend, Siamak Namazi, was detained in Tehran. He's been held in a Vian prison for more than five years. He's an American citizen. His family has also been detained and harassed. Um, this demonstrates to you that it's not really about hardliners or softliners or people in between. This is really about a regime that's determined to maintain power, and so long as diplomacy is an element, it's, so long as nuclear diplomacy can enable the Islamic Republic to survive, they will deal. And so long as it, it in any way threatens the existence of the regime, they will not do a deal. And let's be very frank and and candid about that. Final point is that um, we are where we are. Um, many of us uh, on this call have, I, I think probably all of us, would not have embraced the policy of maximum pressure that the Trump administration put in place. Um, but it, it, it has brought us to this point, um, and we can't go back and relitigate the JCPOA. We cannot spend the next six months uh, or the next four years trying to prove the concept of, of the, the deal that was done in 2015. What we need is a deal that works for this particular moment. We have the most experienced team since 1979 in the Biden administration in terms of dealing with Iran. There's no precedent for this. People who have negotiated in depth on really tough issues for weeks and months and years on end, um, and they understand Iran and the Iranian, uh, the Iranian leadership, and they understand how to do business and how to make diplomacy work. But I, I think it will be important that we don't either have such a commitment to the kind of pride of authorship around the JCPOA or such a, an investment in signaling to the world that we're back and we have returned to business as usual and the Trump years were just an aberration um, that we fixate on the JCPOA as the prize. The prize is not this particular deal. The prize is in fact finding an arrangement that restrains Iran's progress toward uh, some kind of nuclear weapons capability. The JCPOA was a good start at that, but it was never going to be the end under uh, either potential administration. And the other piece of this is in terms of where we are, where we are, is simply that I think there should be some recognition that the Trump administration has answered the question differently uh, on how to use coercive force with respect to Iran's regional activities than all of its predecessors have really since 1979. They were prepared to take greater risks in order to try to set back Iran's capacity to wreak malfeasance across the region. And they have done so in a way that has not produced the cataclysm of, uh, of, uh, of consequences that many of us predicted. Now those may still be coming and there may be pieces of the Iranian retaliation that we have not yet begun to identify simply because uh, whether it's cyber or other types of activity, it may be that these things aren't in the public domain. But I think that one of the important things for the Biden administration will be to try to absorb some of the lessons of what worked and what didn't work from the Trump administration. And one element that didn't work was maximalist economic coercion. Uh, that did not bring Iran to its knees as anticipated. But one element which may have worked better than, than many have given it credit for is the readiness of the Trump administration to take out individuals like Qasem Soleimani, in some ways disrupt acti Iranian activities across the region. And I think it will be quite interesting to see how the Biden administration approaches those questions. Sorry for talking so long and for reiterating points already made and look forward to the conversation. Well, Suzanne, uh, you'll be happy to know that uh, your presentation was really uh, not just uh, it's in sync with Kareem's, but you you built on some critically important points. And it was really trenchant, particularly the issue of whether or not uh, you can actually do more with a regime that 
has as one of its central core uh, issues the notion of using the United States, much like China and Russia have, to mobilize its elites, to maintain itself in power, uh, and to ensure that those who control the country um, are satisfied. That, that's a really critical point uh, with which not everyone agrees. So, Mike, um, I'm surrendering the virtual floor to you with great hopes and expectations. Um, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Aaron. It's a pleasure to join uh, all three of you and to join the audience. Uh, Aaron, you said, we've known each other for a long time. I think the first time I met you was 20 years ago when as a junior officer in uh, Jerusalem, I was trying to find a chair for you at the prime minister's residence. Um, so it's uh, it's good to it's good to renew our, our, our acquaintance uh, over Zoom. Um, look, I, I think that Suzanne and Kareem have uh, covered the waterfront. And so uh, I'll be brief and, and I'll be sort of uh, maybe a bit more tactical uh, when I look at sort of the challenge the Biden administration has ahead of it, which I think is, is a formidable challenge, frankly, um, because really the, the Biden administration, if it's going to succeed on Iran policy, has to satisfy two or arguably three key constituencies um, whose interests do not overlap uh, with any significant degree. The first is Iran. You can't have an agreement uh, over Iran's nuclear program, really, without Iran. Uh, that's uh, the sort of hardest fact of this issue. Second is the Republican Party. Um, the Republican Party support is needed if the, any agreement is going to be sustained over mm -hmm. time. And I think that we have learned that lesson quite clearly over the past four years. And then the third, I think, is Israel and our regional partners, but, but especially Israel, because Israel is a regional state that not only has a strong view on these issues, as do some others, but has shown a capacity to act independently on it. And so if what we agree isn't satisfactory to Israel, we shouldn't expect that they'll simply go along um, and that it will simply hold. Nevertheless, uh, maybe uh, maybe this is a bit counterintuitive, I'm actually optimistic uh, about where we may go over the next four years under a Biden administration. Why am I optimistic? Well, it's not because I, I think a return to the JCPOA is a great idea. Uh, I was a critic of the JCPOA, um, even though I was then uh, not in favor of the Trump administration withdrawing from it. Um, but I'm not excited about the idea of going back to it now. And that's not just because of whatever sort of flaws or shortcomings uh, I may have uh, said it had back in 2015. But it's because I think if you return to the JCPOA, you actually lose all three of those key constituencies uh, that you need to negotiate a stronger deal or to have a, a stronger policy towards Iran. You lose Republicans, uh, obviously, because um, every Republican essentially knows that they're against the JCPOA. And that belief has only been strengthened over the last four years, um, not because of President Trump's policy, but in fact, because of what we've seen from Iran with its uh, with the nuclear archives, uh, so-called nuclear archives, with the access delays at places like Turkuzabad and so forth. Um, uh, you'll, you'll lose the Republicans right away if you go back to the JCPOA. You'll lose Iran, though, as well, because my own view is that Iran had three objectives going into the JCPOA. They wanted to preserve their nuclear option. They wanted to legitimize their nuclear program, which had been uh, constructed clandestinely, and they wanted to get sanctions relief. If in returning to the JCPOA, you fulfill for them all three of those objectives, what further reason do they have? What further incentive do they have to then negotiate a stronger agreement? Um, just getting some marginal sanctions relief is unlikely to prompt them to give up uh, anything more, I would argue. And I think you also lose our regional partners, and especially Israel, who, who dislike the JCPOA and consider it uh, too risky uh, to their interests. The conundrum for Biden is that that's exactly what he's promised to do. He's promised to have a return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. And so he'll need to figure out a way uh, to sort of square that stated intent with the challenge that he faces. But as I said, I'm optimistic. Why am I optimistic? Look, I think President Trump's maximum pressure policy didn't succeed and wasn't going to succeed. Why do I think that? Um, it's not because I think pressure can't deliver results. In fact, we have seen pressure deliver results uh, in our policy towards Iran uh, time and time again, frankly. It's because I believe in, I think, what President Reagan believed in, and that's in armed diplomacy. The idea that force has to be paired with savvy diplomacy if it's going to produce results. And in sanctions, what you have is a form of force, um, not military force, 
um, but economic force. And I think we could argue as to whether that's more or less effective than military force, but it is a form of force. And you have to be able to pair it with savvy diplomacy if it's going to achieve an outcome. Uh, and I think what we saw from the Trump administration was that it was very effective at marshalling that force, but really at the end of the day, wasn't able uh, for various reasons uh, to come up with uh, any kind of creative diplomatic approach that would transform that force into policy results. Now we'll have a Biden administration, which inherits that leverage from the Trump administration, which has a Republican controlled so far Senate, um, which is um, determined to keep the pressure up, but is also experienced with diplomacy and committed to diplomacy. And so I think actually will be in a better position than their predecessors to take the leverage that Trump has given them and turn it into some kind of policy outcome, hopefully a good policy outcome. Um, I think that in addition to doing that, um, they'll need to, and here I think they'll also face pressure from regional partners as well as from domestic uh, partners or, or rivals, as it were, um, to situate, as Suzanne said, the JCPOA or whatever nuclear agreement they come to in a stronger regional policy, a policy not just of countering Iran, but I would argue more importantly of strengthening partners. Because I think when our partners are strong, when regional states are strong, then Iran's opportunities to meddle in a region um, which has been in chaos for some time decreased tremendously. And Iran's uh, sort of key advantage is not really its own strength, which actually isn't that formidable. It's the weakness of states around it. So, so I do think that there's an opportunity here before Biden if he chooses to grasp it. And I think there's different ways to grasp it. And Kareem has, has detailed some of those. Uh, and I won't, I won't reiterate any of that. I think, though, just one last caveat. And this, I think, goes to what both Suzanne and Kareem have said. I think we have to avoid seeing Iran's policy and what happens in Iran as somehow a function of what the United States does. My own view is the Islamic Republic is in trouble. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to fall tomorrow. It doesn't mean they're going to fall within the next four years. But I think what we have seen over the past decade, two decades, is increasing dissatisfaction, increasing tumult within Iran itself. And I think if Iran is in trouble, Iran is going to make trouble uh, for us in the region. It will lash out externally uh, in an effort to divert attention from its problems at home. Even if we have a great policy, even if we come to an agreement that Republicans and Democrats alike uh, can live with, I think we will have those problems. And we'll, we're going to have to deal with that together with our partners, preferably through our partners, if we can, regardless of what President Biden does on this issue. Mike, thanks. You know, the, these presentations really have been remarkable. I, 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 I drew the distinction um, between the art of the possible uh, is is what diplomats do, and the art of the probable is what an an, uh, analysts do. And you've managed, um, frankly, to bridge the gaps on both what are the possibilities and what are the probabilities. Let me, instead of going to my annoying questions initially, let me ask one that Steve Erl Erlinger from the New York Times has asked. Um, and uh, it, it, if, if you could keep your answers as economical as possible, I'd appreciate it. He asks, Steve wanted to know, how hard is it going to be for Iran to come back into compliance, assuming mm -hmm. that we take a different approach than Mike's, and the goal here remains not longer and stronger initially, but compliance. How hard is it going to be? And it'll obviously have to be an orchestrated dance. The U.S. will have to also re-enter. Um, have we given ourselves a bridge too far uh, on what appears to be the, the point of departure for the Biden administration. Kareem, can I ask you on the Iranian side, how hard will it be to come back? Uh, to be honest, Aaron, some of these uh, questions are so technical in nature that I, you know, I tend to defer to my uh, colleagues who have a real granular understanding of it, and perhaps and Mike and Suzanne have that. What, what I'd simply say is that um, on the non-technical side, the psychological side, the mistrust and the hatred right now that the leader feels towards the United States for, you know, first um, unilaterally withdrawing and then these strings of assassinations. Um, I personally think that it will be diff incredibly difficult for them to simply snap their fingers and go back to um, status quo ante. 
And so that's why I, I think notwithstanding what some of my, our colleagues at Carnegie who, who are technical experts say about the challenges of, of, a, of a partial return to the JCPOA, uh, you know, it's, it's, it does seem to me that, you know, a full return, both from a psychological perspective and mm. just a technical perspective is also- That would eliminate uh, one of the challenge. three options, Kareem, that you laid out initially. Um, and obviously it would take a bit of readjustment on the part of the new administration if you can't get it. Uh, counterbalance against Mike's notion that if you just go back, you're gonna alienate just about everybody. Suzanne or Mike, a brief comment on, uh, on Steve Erlinger's question. So, so Aaron, I would make just actually four very brief points about it. Number one, um, I think that uh, for Iran to go back into compliance will take a little bit of time, but more importantly, will take verification, uh, which adds to that time. Yeah. Uh, so on things like reducing their low and rich uranium stockpiles, um, uninstalling centrifuges and things like that, those, those things can be done, but the United States won't take Iran's word for it. Um, the IEA will need to verify those things. And actually, the director general of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, uh, confirmed that uh, just uh, yesterday or, or today, where he said that it would take some time and it would take some negotiation over sequencing to get that done. But second, um, I think there are some things that Iran may not be able to reverse, period. Um, for example, some of the research and development work it's done on advanced centrifuges ahead of the schedule stipulated in the JCPOA, you can't necessarily reverse whatever knowledge they've gained from that. That actually might be an opening for President Biden, because if there are things that Iran can't reverse, well, maybe there are things that we need to demand yeah. from Iran in, in exchange. Third, compliance is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and I think, you know, Aaron, you know, you and I have dealt with Israel on this issue quite a bit. Um, and they'll raise issues, for example, like the facility at Terkuzabad, the nuclear archives. Iran has said certain things which are troubling about, for example, having uh, you know, spare parts uh, in reserve for the Arak facility. My guess is that Republicans certainly will demand that those things be addressed in any quote unquote return to compliance. And then just fourth, and I'll, and I'll end here, and, and um, I don't know, maybe Suzanne has something to say about this. Obviously there are issues for the United States complying as well. Um, it, it's not just a matter of snapping your fingers and delivering sanctions relief. It may take a little time. And then there's the question of things like the designation of the IRGC, Iran's Revolutionary Guards, as a terrorist group. Uh, and will that uh, need to be reversed as part of compliance? My guess is uh, that a lot of people on the Hill and frankly, even some people in the Biden administration may say, no, that's, a, that's an independent issue. Fascinating. I mean, it argues... If there were more trust and confidence, you could actually have a process over time that works this out, but there isn't. Uh, I want to ask a question about time. Suzanne, unless you have a brief comment you want to offer? Well, it, it, why don't you pose the question because my point was going to be on time. Okay. You know, Woody Allen once said that 90%, 80% of life is just showing up. Well, we know that he may be partially correct. It's not just showing up, it's showing up at the right time. And time is critically important to the success of any negotiation. So you have a new administration, January, February. You have uh, Iran's elections in June. Karim has convinced me that maybe they're not as determinative with respect to uh, altering uh, Iran's views of these negotiations. But I guess that's my, that's my question. Is this January, June, how critical is the January to June space for doing something that would potentially de-escalate the situation, you know, uh, small, medium, large, whatever. How how important is it? Suzanne, do you want to take a uh, a shot at this? Sure, and the, and I'll, I'll weave in the point I was going to make on on how possible is it for the two sides to come back into compliance. Um, and I think this is just the critical question that none of this can be done with a snap of the fingers. It is all going to take time. And uh, on both sides, there are serious disincentives to moving too quickly from the point of view of domestic politics. So, you know, what we have to do is set up a process that doesn't um, you know, sort of uh, incentivize quick movement. What we need is actual serious diplomacy. We need to revive some form of direct dialogue with the Iranians. Obviously, you know, the new national security advisor has 
considerable experience and expertise in in doing just that. But it needs to be done below that level. I mean, that you know, this the the context has also changed from from 2010, 2011, 2013, um, when we saw the incipient first back channel and then public reinvigoration of first bilateral diplomacy between the United States and Iran and then a multilateral channel. Um, so what we need to do is ensure that there's somebody empowered below Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken, despite their um, you know, genuine and, and, and really valuable knowledge of how to do this, who's prepared to sit down with counterparts on the Iranian side and begin to think through what the sequencing would be on a series of steps that would build confidence and would lay out the parameters for constraining Iran's nuclear program as was originally done during the JCPOA. And without the sort of, uh, I think, requirement on either side that it has to be the absolute return to the JCPOA because as we've all said, there, there are arguments against that from both sides. The other piece of this that I think is more important than the Iranian political calendar because that's entirely manipulable um, is, is the question of, of what the Iranians want in return and what they've articulated publicly and what I think, you know, there's some sympathy toward within the broader political space within Iran is that, you know, this, this entire gambit by the Trump administration cost them tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of foregone oil sales and, and, and economic growth, which would have uh, occurred in a normal situation had the JCPOA been in implementation. They want compensation, they want reparations, and it's going to be a difficult thing for them to back down from um, at a time where you know, the economy is under severe duress. But fundamentally, both sides want a deal, both sides want and need some kind of constraints on Iran's nuclear program and some kind of pathway back to the international financial system and oil exports for Iran. And so it seems to me that that can be done, it can be hammered out over time, uh, as long as we don't put the expectations too high. Yeah, I think the issue of over time is critical because the Middle East has demonstrated that in many respects, many, many respects, that there are only two speeds, slow and slower. And I wonder, I'm going to make sure that this session, we find a way to get this session both to Tony Blinken and to uh, and to Jake Sullivan, because so far it's, you know, my head is exploding given all of the issues that cross-cutting that needs to need to be addressed in order to do something. So let me ask you about a, a, a terrible world, word here, modalities. Um, would Iran be up for a discrete, secret channel, either brokered by a good Samaritan, the Omanis, or are they going to insist on discussions in a multilateral framework where the U.S., and Iran would only engage on the margins, uh, under the auspices of the P5 plus one. Can we go back to where I think you'd have to, uh, to really secret, discreet talks? Is that where we're headed? Kareem, you want to try that? Yep, it's a great question, Aaron. Uh, a couple of things. I, I do think that uh, the leader, especially given all of the things that's transpired the last four years with these assassinations of Soleimani and Fakhrizadeh, would find it difficult to agree to the types of major U.S.-Iran public interactions of, you know, Zarif and, and Kerry embracing and spending all that time together that happened during the Obama administration. So on one hand, it, it, it seems to me that kind of private, very private um, diplomacy may be preferable. Um, I'm sorry for the construction outside. That's, uh, that's uh, not my kitchen, it's, it's the street. Um, but what I would say is that um, this was obviously a very sensitive point for our regional partners, both in the Gulf and Israel, that we engaged in that private back channel and we they, they felt that we betrayed them. This time around, there may be the advantage that that stuff is out in the open, that um, you know there was, the, the people know that uh, there is going to be a dialogue with Iran. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question I could answer both ways because on one hand, 
I think the leader doesn't want just the U.S.-Iran uh, uh, dialogue. He would prefer it to be in a multilateral context. Um, on the other hand, he doesn't want a, a big public setting. So I don't know how you do multilateral diplomacy in a very private, closed setting. So it's going to be, it's a good question about modalities. I'm curious to hear what Mike and Suzanne say. Mike, do you have a thought? I do. You know, I mean, Aaron, you're you're a veteran of many negotiations. And so, you know, these sort of shape of the table discussions can sometimes be as complicated as sub substantive discussions. But I think the key point here is that they're not mutually exclusive. So I expect that Iran will perceive that it has support for its position from the rest of the P5 plus one, that the Trump administration's position withdrawing from the JCPOA, imposing sanctions uh, was really not popular uh, amongst the rest of the world, frankly, except perhaps within the Middle East itself. And so they'll want, I think, the other members of the P5 plus one at the table to sort of pile on the pressure for the US to come back to the agreement. And that means that you know, for the Biden administration, they'll need to have a separate dialogue first, hopefully, with the E3, the, the UK, France, and Germany, as well as maybe even Russia and China to, to sort of break that dynamic, ensure that they're not sort of uh, uh, ganged up upon, as it were, in that format. But I expect also that, look, to be frank, Iran is going to have to give a little bit, at least here, hopefully give you know significantly here. And I think that, to Kareem's point, they may prefer to sort of negotiate that element uh, of this in private, um, to avoid some of the sort of PR problems that may come with uh, making any additional concessions in terms of their own domestic context. Suzanne? Well, I think for the Biden administration, there, there should be an element of both public and private. The public should be very quick and meaningful gesture in the early weeks of the new administration around humanitarian issues to ensure that Iran has access to both finance and materiel needed to manage the pandemic, which has hit them hard earlier and harder than almost any other country in the world. Um, and, and also to, to provide a reliable channel for transactions involving um, food as well as medicines and pharmaceutical devices. So that's an easy thing that can be done and I think it will help to um, signal to the Iranians uh, readiness to, to work uh, back toward the deal. And also importantly, I think signals to, to the rest of the world that we are no longer in a situation of maximalist pressure. Um, I, and then I think, you know, the, the, the other piece needs to be private, that there needs to be a quiet dialogue established between American and Iranian counterparts. Um, whether or not you bring the P5 plus one in at the, at the earliest days, I think, you know, will have to be walked carefully because there are lots of stakeholders and, um, you know, expanding the number of people in that conversation doesn't make it easier. But uh, keeping them at arm's length uh, also creates complications. So my guess is that, you know, given the, the facility of, of this administration of managing that kind of a quiet dialogue with the Iranians, they've, they've already done some serious thinking about this and prepared to do that. Um, but, you know, you need to, to look at both the public messaging as well as the private engagement. Yeah. Uh, Professor Sharon Squassoni of the Elliott School at GW asks, uh, I'll, I'll shorten her question. Um, so Biden decides to re-engage and re-enter the JCPOA. How does that hurt him? Mike, you've laid out a, a, a fascinating case on paper that uh, simply re-entry is going to quote unquote lose uh, the R's in the Senate and maybe a few D's, uh, the Israelis, um, who do have leverage that the Saudis and the Emiratis may not have, and may lose the, Ir the Iranians themselves. So what would you say, um, briefly, how does Biden get hurt? Uh, whether or not he succeeds, if in fact that is his approach. Well, look, I think that if if the policy really is just, you know, compliance for compliance, I think the Iranians will say will say yes, although they may try to squeeze uh, additional concessions out of the United States at some point. I, I think the question is, number one, is it the right policy? And number two, is it a sustainable policy? Uh, on the first question, you know, we're not uh, going to relitigate the JCPOA. Um, but as I said, I think um, there'll be plenty uh, in Congress and not just Republicans who will feel that um, in addition to whatever initial criticisms they had of the JCPOA, now they're even more concerned because of what has transpired since 
because of the uh, fact that many of the sunsets, one of the sunsets has already come and others are right on the horizon. And number three, we have built up this, you know, uh, presumed leverage uh, and we would be giving it away for nothing in return, essentially. Um, so, so that's sort of on the, the one hand. But then the second question is sustainability. You know, I, I think that um, even if Biden were inclined to ignore all that and say, no, this is the right thing to do. Um, he understands that uh, if he only has four years as president, that's basically how long that policy would last if he's succeeded by a Republican, um, because there is no sufficient domestic constituency to uphold the JCPOA. And when we negotiate a, a deal with a foreign, ad, foreign partner, whether it's an ally or an adversary, you can't just think about the negotiation with that external party. You have to think about your own internal domestic negotiation as well. And we understand that, I think, intuitively when it comes to things like trade deals. You need to have unions on board. You need to have, um, you need to have commerce on board and so forth. Um, but we tend to ignore it, uh, uh, frankly, uh, at our own risk when it comes to these types of foreign policy deals. Not to mention you're facing a president that's going to be challenged with the, the greatest set of crises probably uh, since any president since Franklin Roosevelt with limited political bandwidth to expend if he in fact he can't find a, a way uh, a way to um, to succeed um, I have uh, we're nearing the end of the hour uh, I have one quick question question for a round and then my final question, which admittedly I'll concede up front, uh, reflects my own bias about moving forward. My question for all of you quickly is, what does Iran fear most with respect to um, the United States? Kareem? My answer will actually be counterintuitive, which is that I think for the Supreme Leader, um, what he fears is the type of stuff that happened during the Obama administration, which was, you know, U.S. outreach, attempts at reconciliation, Obama writing letters to him, him having to respond to that. Um, you know, if you start with the premises, I think Suzanne and, and Mike also start with, which is, he wants, he, he believes that Iran needs enmity with the United States. The revolution needs enmity with the United States. Then for him, kind of what I would call contained enmity is the ideal option. He, he doesn't want an outright confrontation on the types of killings and assassinations that were happening during the Trump administration, but nor does he want reconciliation. And so I think one of the um, pos positive aspects of a Biden administration is, is potentially removing the pretext for Iran's internal failures and uh, malign regional behavior is saying it's a reaction to Trump, um, you know, the United States getting out of the way and it kind of exposing Iran as, as the malign actor, not the United States. Right. Suzanne, briefly. Yeah, I, Kareem said it better than than I possibly could. I, but I think, you know, the, the ultimate fear of, of Hamadeh on almost on every issue with every administration is regime change. And that fear um, there, you know, the, the, the modalities, as you put it, um, change via administration, but um, an administration like the Biden one that is prepared to engage, that wants to use the levers of diplomacy as well as uh, military power um, will in fact be as threatening to the Islamic Republic as uh, the Trump administration was just in a, in a different context. And um, this, uh, I think, poses real challenges for Khamenei and the senior leadership of the Islamic Republic at a time where uh, they are beginning to pass from the scene. And, and Khamenei has to be uh, contemplating his own legacy as well as his own longevity. So how to strengthen the system um, so that it can withstand the uh, pressure from within and without, I think, is the, is the foremost um, uh, priority for this regime. And um, I think it will be really interesting, as Kareem says, to see how uh, they respond to a, a, a much more capable and I think very well prepared diplomatic team um, that is not going to give ground uh, to the Iranians uh, and give them opportunities to exploit uh, American missteps. Mike, I know you have a hard stop at 11. So in a sentence or two, because I have one final question for all of you. 
Yeah, well, no, I, I agree with Suzanne and Kareem. I, I think the Iranian regime and regimes like it, they, they fear their own people more than anything. And they've shown that time and again. You don't execute journalists, children, you know, uh, Olympic athletes, uh, unless you're terrified of your people. And anything we do that empowers Iranians uh, is terrifying for the regime. Right. Okay, so here's my final question. I mean, I know I'm getting old and I've been around the blocks many times on these issues. I, I, I tend to be wary of transformations. I mean, they're very rare. Life is about transactions, usually when it comes to diplomacy, even in the best of circumstances. And what I can't really figure out is if in fact Iran's, the regime's objective is not to appear domesticated in the wake of any deal with Washington, how do you then work on a transformational agreement that restricts Iran's ballistic missile technology, that caps its nuclear aspirations, and which contains, retards, and undermines its role in the region. If you succeeded in doing all those things, Iran would change. It would have a different foreign policy. So in the end, in the one minute we have, doesn't that push the discussion toward the transactional with pretty low expectations about what can be done with respect to Iran or, or am I missing something? Quickly. Kareem, then Suzanne, then Mike. Aaron, I agree with the premise of your question, which is that we should curb our enthusiasm. This isn't about big transformational diplomacy. You know, we want to get small victories, constrain Iran's behavior. And um, as Suzanne alluded to from the get-go, there's not likely going to be any meaningful change until the Supreme Leader leaves the scene. So I think we need to be realistic about that. Mike, I know you have to run. A final word of, from you? Sure thing, Aaron. Well, I think you know the answer to your question, which is <laughs> how do you how do you get that kind of transformational agreement? You don't. You right. accept there are no silver bullets here, and we're going to need to have a long-term policy of deterring and containing the threats from Iran until Iran changes of its own accord. Suzanne, final word to you. Yeah, I, I, I echo what both of my co-panelists have just said. There, there are no transformational deals with respect to Iran. There are transactional deals to be made. The policy, though, should be intent, devised with an intent to transform. Um, and that means that you invest in diplomacy with your partners and allies that is ambitious, um, but is prepared to manage a very imperfect situation. As we close out 2020 for Carnegie Connects in the year, this has been one of the best discussions we've had. It, really, I'm not sure you could you could have condensed in an hour uh, so much on both internal, external, and options available for the Biden administration. So uh, Suzanne, Kareem, Mike, I wanna thank you for joining. And to all of our devoted followers of Carnegie Connects, I wanna thank you for participating throughout what has been an extremely difficult year. We're gonna have an exciting agenda in 20, 2021. And I truly wish all of you a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and I'm praying and hoping uh, that 2021 turns out to be uh, a year of security, prosperity, and fulfillment, and far better than anything and everything we've experienced during the course of the last year. So stay well, stay healthy, uh, and we'll see you all on the proverbial other side. Thanks again.